That's the end stage of mass formation. This radical intolerance for everything that goes against this absurd theory uh, the masses believe in, uh, and which uh, the cruelties which are committed to everyone, even to the people whom uh, they used to love most before the mass formation started, such as their own children, their own sons and daughters. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. I am so excited for today's guest. We are talking with one of the foremost leading authorities on something called mass formation as it pertains to COVID-19. This is, of course, Dr. Matthias Tesmet. He is a professor of clinical psychology at Ghent University in Belgium. Hey, uh, Matthias, so great to have you back here with us today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for inviting me again, Dr. Martinson. And this is the book we're talking about, this one right here. If you get it, which you absolutely should, it won't come with all these uh, note marks and everything. Matthias, I, I marked up this book more than any other book I've read in, in years because uh, you were just hitting me with line after line. It's the psychology of totalitarianism. What is totalitarianism, very briefly, so we can set the stage? And is this something people need to be concerned about today? Oh, well, yes, totalitarianism. If we are talking about totalitarianism, we are thinking in the first place about uh, communism, Nazism, uh, the Soviet Union, and so on. And that were indeed the first totalitarian systems. Um, so the first totalitarian systems in the, 20, in the first part of the 20th century. Before the 20th century, totalitarianism did not exist. That's important to know. Many people confuse totalitarianism with classical dictatorships, but it's something completely different. A classical dictatorship is very simple. The psychological structure of a classical dictatorship is very simple. It's a group, it's, it's the population that is scared of a small group of people, uh, the dictatorial regime. And, uh, and therefore, this, the population accepts that this small group of people imposes unilaterally its social contract to a society. That's a classical dictatorship. Totalitarian states, states are something completely different. The psychological basis is, com is completely different. It's much more impressive, the psychological basis, uh, and much more profound. Totalitarian systems are based on the process of mass formation. That means a small group, um, uh, a kind of group dynamic, uh, which uh, uh, makes that a part of the population fanatically believes in a certain narrative or a certain ideology. And when this, this group, this mass, is led by a few leaders, uh, they can easily seize control of society. And that's when uh, a new kind of state system emerged, uh, a totalitarian state, which uh, does not only control politic, political space and public space, such as a classical dictatorship does, but which also controls private space uh, because the totalitarian state has a huge secret police at its disposal, namely this part of the population that fanatically believes in the state narrative. So that's a totalitarian state. Uh, Hannah Arendt uh, warned us that um, in 1951 already that we've seen uh, communist totalitarianism, we've seen uh, fascist totalitarianism, but that the new totalitarianism, the totalitarianism of the future would be a technocratic totalitarianism. That, would, that means a kind of totalitarian state which is led not by gang leaders such as Stalin and Hitler, but by dull bureaucrats and technocrats. And uh, that's what I think around 2017, I had the impression that we were ready for such a new technocratic totalitarianism. And when the Corona crisis started, I, I, in my interpretation, We've seen this huge leap forward um, towards a technocratic system, uh, which is a system which is led by technocratic experts rather than, than by democratically elected politicians. Uh, and uh, well, that was when I started to think about the book on, a, on a, um, uh, this new technocratic totalitarian system that uh, might emerge now. Or that is All right. Now. Well, it absolutely has so many things to talk about, but I, I really want to make sure I have my, my arms around this and the listeners can follow along. The idea behind a totalitarian system as opposed to a dictatorship. Dictatorship's a strong person. They rule with fear. You understand what's happening. But totalitarianism is, is a structure that people buy into fundamentally, right? And that structure, it's an idea. It's an ideology. 
And that ideology doesn't have to make sense, doesn't have to be sensible often. Isn't that actually a feature of it, that it's kind of, on some level, provably nonsense? Uh, you know, that we'll get to this great utopian ideal if we just kill all these people over here, um, or something like that? Do I have that right? Yeah, yes, absolutely. And uh, 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 totalitarianism all starts with, with, with this, indeed, this, this fanatic belief in the population that uh, a certain reshaping of society is needed to save the world from all kinds of uh, dramatic uh, problems or from all kinds of objects of anxiety. Uh, that's how totalitarianism starts. Um, it starts from an ideological conviction, a blind and fanatic ideological conviction. Uh, um, uh, and, 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 and so it, that, that makes that it is completely different from a, from a classical dictatorship. For instance, in a classical dictatorship, the point of gravity of the system is always situated at the level of the elite. If you eliminate a part of the dictatorial elite, a substantial part, then usually the system, the, di the dictatorship will collapse. But in a totalitarian state, the point of gravity is not so much situated in the elite, it's rather situated in this part of the population that is in the grip, fanatically in the grip of this ideology. And ultimately, the root cause of the totalitarian system is always the ideology itself. The ideology itself, which has a grip both on the elite and on the masses. So uh, the ideology in the Soviet Union, for instance, was historical materialism of Marx, the ideology uh, that seized control of the of, of, of society in Nazi Germany was um, kind of race theory, neo-Darwinist race theory. And now I believe that the ideology that uh, is imposing itself to society now is a rather a kind of transhumanist ideology, a technocratic ideology. And, 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 and then you see that this ideology um, is becoming dominant or, or, or is taking control of society through all kinds of narratives. That's important. You have to mm. distinguish between the ideology and the narratives that are used, often by the elite, to convince people to go along with the ideology or to accept all these changes that or this reshaping of society that is needed if uh, for this new society to be created and these, these narratives in, in my opinion now are like the climate narrative they are the the corona narrative uh, the, the the narrative of the war on terror all these narratives are in one way or another narratives that make people feel as if it is unavoidable that we need more technological control, that we cannot rely on democratic uh, decision-making procedures, but that we need experts to take control of society through technological uh, devices or through te technological instruments, uh, or that otherwise we will never be able to successfully deal with all these objects of anxieties, the, 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 the terrorists, the, the, the viruses, the, the anti-vaxxers, the uh, no matter what, um, uh, climate change and so on. So that's, that's a little bit the mechanism. You have to distinguish between the ideology and, uh, and, and the narratives that are used to, 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 to convince people that uh, the ideological changes are necessary. Um, but at the end, it's the ideology itself, whether we are talking about uh, the Nazi ideology or transhumanism or the uh, uh, historical materialist ideology, in the end, it always boils down, it are all different variants of the same ideology. It are all variants of mechanist ideology, the mechanist view on man and the world. The idea that the entire universe is like a dead material machine, uh, a set of elementary particles that interact with each other according to the laws of mechanics, and that's crucial, that can be perfectly understood in a rational way. That's the idea, the basic, the essence of mechanist ideology, the belief that the universe is a machine and that everything can be understood in a rational way, controlled in a rational way, manipulated in a rational way, and that the essence of life can be reduced to the categories of our own, of our own our own logical understanding. That's the core problem we are facing now. 
It's that kind of thinking, that kind of ideology that ultimately leads to the concentration camps. That's what I describe in my book. I connect these two things to each other uh, in my book. This mechanist ideology and the end result, there's a, these totalitarian systems uh, uh, of the 20th and 21st century. Yes, and, and <clears throat> we're talking with, with Matthias Tesmet, uh, author of this book, The Psychology of Totalitarianism. And, and I, I, I have to thank you for writing this. And I've been coming at this from a slightly different angle for a while, but, but this, I love rotating the Rubik's Cube and coming in from a different angle. So the idea that, hey, this all begins, you kind of pin this at the Enlightenment. Good idea. We're going to be very rational. We're going to come out of our superstitious phase. But then maybe we just overdid it, right? We just went too far down that path. And of course, what I love that you connect here, I'm a scientist by training, and I still read lots of science and physics and all this. And, and what's amazing to me, you study some of the same people, listen to the same scientists, is that good scientists, when they get right to the edge of what the known is, they almost invariably become spiritual in some level because they go, wow, I rationalized my way all the way down to the heart of this thing and it's completely irrational. <laughs> Meaning, you know, it's, 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 it's ineluctable. You can't describe it in words. You can't, you can't get your arms around it. The more you try to understand it, the less you can. So you have to come at it with the irrational side of us, which we could also call intuition. Um, so, so connect those pieces for us. Like this is, if, if I'm understanding this book right, not to jump to the conclusion, but there's an evolutionary process here, and that's what's before us right now. Nothing less than sort of maybe the heart of our species is really at a cusp of something here. And if we get it wrong, we go down a place that ends in mass atrocity. Guess what? We've been there before. Probably not a lot more to learn from that, except it, it, it sucks. Uh, but there's this other path we could take. But first, we have to understand the dimension of the problem. W w how has enlightenment led us astray, in your view? Or how is yeah, our interpretation well. of it? Yes. Uh, as you said, uh, the strange thing is that we all believe that this mechanist view on man and the world is the scientific view on man and the world. But the strange thing is that this actually um, uh, is not correct because most seminal scientists, uh, they almost all started more or less from this mechanist view on the man and the world. But very soon they acknowledged that this view on man and the world is extremely limited. That's something that was very well articulated by, for instance, René Tom one of the most famous uh, mathematicians of the 20th century and one of the founding fathers of systems theory, he said, this part of reality that can be understood in a rational way, in a rational mechanist way, is very limited. And the rest of reality, we can only understand through empathically resonating with it. So he was talking about two different kinds of knowing the world. On the one hand, there is this rational way to know the world, and on the other hand, there is this other way of knowing the world, which is a resonating way, an empathic way of knowing the world, which is hard to define, but there are two different ways to know the world. And he used two different words in French for knowing. He used savoir, which refers to voir, to see, to what you can see with the eye. So there is a certain knowledge that you can generate by looking at the world with your eyes and thinking logically about what you see. That's the rational knowledge of the world. But then he also referred to this different uh, way of knowing the world, this resonating knowledge. And that, for that word, he used the word connaître, which means as much as, if you look at it, co-naître means to be born together. That means that, that means that this kind of knowledge is a knowledge that uh, is a revelatory and which makes you understand things in a new way as if you're born again. So it are, it are two different way of, ways of knowledge. There's this rational knowledge and the resonating knowledge. And also traditions mm -hmm. such as a samurai tradition in Japan and every mystical tradition, I think, knew that difference. The samurai tradition in Japan said that every time you learn something, an art or a craft, there is this first stage of the learning process, which is a technical, rational stage. You learn certain techniques. For instance, if you learn the martial arts, you will learn certain techniques in a rational way, which make you understand what you should do if you're under attack, for instance. And then, but the first stage of learning an art is always practicing these techniques. That's the rational stage. But if you practice for a very long time, you will start to develop a different kind of knowledge, a kind of feeling, a kind of mm -hmm. resonating knowledge. And it's that knowledge that is the 
aim, the goal, the end result of a learning process. And the samurai said, it's difficult, they said, to learn the techniques of a martial art, but it's even more difficult to forget them again. And if you don't succeed in forgetting them again, before you go to the battlefield, you will die on the battlefield. And that shows like it's exactly the same with science. There is a first stage, stage of science, which is a rational stage. And then the sciences of, of the 20th century and even the, the sciences of the 19th century as well showed it so clearly. They showed that certain objects, for instance, certain phenomena in nature can be rationally understood to a certain extent, but the core of the phenomena can never escapes all rational understanding. Niels Bohr said, when it comes to atoms, language, so Niels Bohr, the famous physicist, uh, he said, uh, when he won the Nobel Prize, he said, when it comes to atoms, language can only be used as poetry. And he meant, he was dead serious. He mm -hmm. meant that when you try to grasp the behavior of elementary particles, you will understand a certain part of it in rational terms, in logical terms, but in the end, the core of it is radically irrational. He said that no theory could be right if she was not completely absurd. And uh, for me, it was, it, was a, it was a complex dynamical systems theory, which made me wake up at that level. When I was about 35 years old, and when I, when I dived deep into the uh, mathematical basis of complex dynamical systems theory, I suddenly understood that the essence of life and of nature is irrational. That's what it shows. This theory shows it paradoxically in a strictly rational way that the essence of every complex, complex dynamical system, that it always behaves irrationally, literally like an irrational number. So science as well, just like the samurai tradition or any, uh, every mystical tradition starts from rationality. But if you walk down the road of rationality to the very end, you will soon stumble upon a land that you can never enter uh, with rational thinking. And there you have to switch. You have to develop this other kind of knowing the world, this much more resonating way of knowing the world, a way to know the world, of knowing the world, which brings you in touch with the real, which brings you in touch with the eternal principles of life, which are, it, which, which are ethical principles. <laughs> that's, that's so, so you make this switch from an existence based on rational understanding to an existence based on a more resonating knowing and in which you feel, become in touch with principles which can never be articulated in a definitive way, I think, but which allow you to position yourself in life and in society towards other people. So I think that so I've, I've when I went through that process myself in a very concrete way, in which I, I was a very someone who very stubbornly uh, tried to understand in a rational way. And at the moment mm -hmm. where I started to, 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 to become aware of the fact that uh, rational understanding is, 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 is limited and never capable of grasping the essence of life, um, it was like a true revelation for me. I started to feel that suddenly that if you are convinced that everything around you can be reduced to the categories of your own logical understanding, you actually constantly destroy your connection with life. You constantly destroy your awareness of the mystery of life. And I, I quite literally, I think that it is as if, if we fanatically think in a logical way, it is as if we connect to one logical idea to the other logical ID, that's what logic says. It connects one ID to one other ID, to one other ID, to one other ID. It is literally as if we build a wall around us, a wall through which we isolate ourselves from the music of life, from the, from the vibration of life. And as soon as you can start to accept that your logical understanding will always be limited, and will never deliver you the ultimate knowledge. It is as if all these logical building blocks slide mm -hmm. away a little bit from each other. And as if the eternal music of life can enter your being through the holes and can touch the strings of your being and can make you resonate with the eternal vibration of life. And that's the moment as well when you start to overcome 
the fear of death and dying just because you feel that you're part of something eternal. So that, that is my own experience. Uh, um, so it's not, I'm not against rational understanding, not at all. We have to walk the path of rationality as far as possible to finally reach the limit and enter a country that is so much more beautiful than the rational, uh, uh, the country of rational understanding, the, the land of rational understanding. Um, um, so rationality, perfect, very necessary. Uh, we are not rational enough, <laughs> but if we would be rational enough, we would soon arrive at the limit of rationality. And that's the entire problem, of course. Uh, science in the beginning was uh, equal to open-mindedness. It was like a, a discourse mm -hmm. through which a minority went against a dominant discourse. And at that moment, science was throat speech. The, the science was a discourse through which people, at the risk of their own life, at the risk of their career, at the, at the, at the risk of everything, uh, tried to articulate something that was new. But as soon as science, as a consequence of its success, it, it, success, it became successful, as a consequence of that, it became the discourse of the majority. It became the dominant discourse itself. And as such, it became the privileged instrument to manipulate the population, to be successful. And it lost all its characteristics of truth speech. And that's where we are now. We are dealing with something that calls itself, itself science, but which is actually has nothing to do with science anymore. It's an ideology. It's a prejudice. It's a dogmatic system. It's, in many respects, a cheat, a lie. Uh, uh, the replication crisis showed this so clearly. It showed us that up to 85% of the published research findings cannot be reproduced and or false. Thank you for saying all of that. This is why I, I, I love this book, because we've come to many of the same places. Um, one of my favorite quotes out there is Carl Jung says, said, uh, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. And when I troll through the, the um, biographies and autobiographies of a lot of these famous people, they are all very humble, and many of them express something along the lines of, it wasn't me. I was a vessel. There was this idea, and, and there was this knowing, this gnosis, G-N-O. Gnosis, there was this knowing that I had to try and wrestle with and figure out what to do with, but it wasn't my idea. They were very humble that there were almost like there's an intelligence out there that they could, they could grasp onto. Right, Where that comes from, we'll have a bigger debate about that, but they all say kind of the same thing, and I can feel that in my own life. So to me, the number one critique where I would say, here's why I don't like totalitarianism, is that it's fundamentally to me, Matthias, it's boring. It asks me to subsume myself into a collective ideology that itself is not complete. It's small. It doesn't want me to be my authentic self. It doesn't want me to be different in any way. It just wants me to fit in. And it's, it, it couldn't even possibly complete, compete with nature and the beauty of the actual universe I'm in. So that's, that's my main critique is like progressivism, collectivism, totalitarianism, all those isms to me are just, they're boring. Fundamentally, I think they're asking people not to live. And that's a crime, actually, as far as I'm concerned, a, a, a sort of a soul crime, if you will. But you're saying that, the, so this is really the totalitarianism, let's not go there, it ends badly, ends in mass atrocities. There's things we can talk about, and I'd love to talk next about how we maybe we need brave people to avoid that. But it's we're not here. I'm not here to talk with you so that we can find out how to avoid darkness. I'm here to find out like the opportunity in this story is that actually this is a great moment for people to wake up and say, oh, actually, it's not just a totalitarianism. It was the whole subset of conditions that led to that totalitarianism. Those were so bleak that totalitarianism made sense. So I don't want to return to the prior conditions either. The question is, where do we go forward? And to me, that's why this story has so much energy. It's so exciting because this is an opportunity for people to actually wake up in this life they have and 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 find the idea that's trying to speak through them or whatever their their arc is, right? So that that's how I'm just all the clues are there. And I love the way you've assembled them because the scientists who've who've probed at the edge are just people who saw and all the good ones I would submit to you have what you described as that that empathy. They they were in the system of study long enough that they developed the empathy. Jane Goodall and her chimps, right? Takes decades, but finally, like, they're not chimps to her, right? They're, they are creatures, beings, sentient, um, resonating in a different way, perhaps. So that's what I think is, is the opportunity here, is, is to wake up finally. Um, and I don't know, is that 
resonate with you at all? Oh, yes, very much. I agree. What we are going through is a process in which something new is born. It's what, what we see now is a, is a large, if you take a little bit of distance, what we, what we see now is a large organism, uh, a, a dominant discourse, a dominant a mainstream society who puts a lot of pressure on a small group and who, who pushes this small group on a path where it would never go without this pressure. And it, 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 this small group will go through a process and if it makes the right ethical decisions, it will become stronger and stronger and stronger at the mental, at the psychological, even at the spiritual level. And while the large group will exhaust itself, will become weaker and weaker and weaker, the small group will become stronger and stronger and stronger throughout a very difficult mm -hmm. process. And it will be perfectly ready at the perfect moment to deliver the new principles for human living together. That's what I believe. And the result will be so beautiful that we cannot imagine it now at the moment. That I, I believe that. And let me, but first, you know, you said, and I couldn't agree more with that, that the problem of totalitarianism has to do with the fact that it believes that it knows everything. <laughs> it's it, it, <laughs> somewhere, it, situate, it situates knowledge inside the human being. While the seminal scientists you refer to, such as Carl Gustav Jung, uh, you, uh, you named uh, Carl Gustav Jung, they tended to situate knowledge outside themselves. It's out mm -hmm. there. And from time to time, you can receive it. From time to time, it will be revealed to you. And that, in my opinion, is essential. It's essential because the human being, uh, it's clear that if, if you compare, uh, I, I think, I think the, 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 the entire tragedy of, of the tradition of enlightenment uh, and of our current, of the, of the situation we are now in, is exactly this, that people were seduced to believe that uh, they could explain everything, they could explain the essence of life. And it's exactly this, um, uh, I think, that indeed leads to a kind of dullness, a kind of deadness. It's that, yeah. in, in a strange way, I think um, that, you know, Within this materialist world, which can be perfectly described in mechanist in the terms of classical mechanics, which can be perfectly rationally understood, um, within this world, there is no such thing as a soul, or there is no such, such, such thing as a knowledge outside of ourselves, a God, a divine being or something. But, but the strange thing is that very soon, as people declared God dead, very soon they sneak to his throne and they install themselves on the throne. So that's what you see now in ideologies. And ideologies, ideologies such as uh, 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 the ideology of Yuval Noah Harari, where uh, that he describes in his book uh, *Homo Deus*. Uh, ex that's exactly this. The human being started to believe, and much earlier than uh, uh, Yuval Harari, even in the 18th and the 19th century, there were already these um, uh, philosophers who declared that uh, the human being. Uh, could become a divine-like being, that it could become God-like, that it could become God, that in the end, if it understood the material basis, the mechanist basis uh, of life well enough, that then it, it, it would be able to live eternally, to, uh, to, uh, to suffer, to end all suffering, to, um, oh, yeah, to, be, to be in a constant state of happiness through the manipulation of the biochemical um, um, aspects of, its, of, 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 of the human being and so on. So that's the entire problem. This is doomed to fail, of course. You can clearly say uh, even a psychological analysis, analysis of the structure uh, of our mental functioning shows very clearly that the human being uh, will always be limited at the level of knowledge. For instance, we are always inclined to think that uh, animals differ, that human beings differ from animals because they know more, because they have more knowledge. But actually, that's not really true. In the first place, the human being differs from an animal because its existence gravitates constantly around something that it doesn't understand, about something that it doesn't know. For instance, you will never see uh, uh, an animal sitting on a, on a, on a, on a, on a chair or a bank, uh, uh, breaking its head, thinking about what the, the meaning of its existence is, uh, whether or not the other animals love it or uh, what will happen after it dies or something animals don't do that the human being does that the the, 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 the mind the mental system of the human being constantly gravitates at, around something it cannot grasp about something that it doesn't know and that's a consequence 
of its mental system. Animals communicate with each other. Animals, um, uh, the mental system of animals is based on sign systems. And that are systems in which every sign refers to one specific object in which there is never substantial doubt when a, an animal sees a sign, receives a sign of another animal, for instance, there will never be a profound fundamental doubt about the meaning of the sign. There might be some doubt, but never very much. And, and, and human beings, it's completely different. When uh, one human being says something to another human being, it must what, it, what is being said must always be interpreted. The words that are used always refer not so much to an object, not in the first place to an object. They always refer to other words, meaning that the meaning of a word, a word is always dependent on the other words, the context that is delivered. And in that way, the, human be the, the, the meaning of words constantly changes and we are never really sure about what the other means. If the other smiles at us, does it mean that he likes us? Or does it mean that he is laughing at us? And so on. Uh, uh, there is always a large part of uncertainty in a human being. And that's, it's just like that. The mental system of a human being is never capable to uh, assign definitive meaning to words. And we will, ever, we will forever be unsure. There will always be a mystery in our lives. And in the first, at first sight, this might make us insecure and anxious because uh, we human beings have a hard time dealing with uncertainty. But... Uh, actually, it's exactly because we can never be certain that we all have the right to live life in our own way and that we all have the ethical duty. We have no other possibility than to give our, our, our own answers to, uh, uh, in life. And that is exactly, it's the uncertainty that makes a human being truly hu humane. And every time someone tries to eliminate this uncertainty, he dehumanizes life. And that's exactly what totalitarian leaders do. do. Totalitarian leaders believe that they have the ultimate answers. Stalin said it literally. My, popu my population, he said, should react like a dog of Pavlov to what I say. They shouldn't think. They should, they should react as machines. When I say this, they, sh they should do that. And when I say something else, they should do something else. So he wanted to exclude all uncertainty. He wanted to impose one way, one theory, one ideology uh, in a relentless way to society. That's so characteristic of totalitarianism. It's the core root of totalitarianism. The word totalitarianism in the first place means exactly that. Total. That means total. A total theory of how society should be organized. Uh, it, 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 un it, 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 it makes life uniform. Everyone should behave in the same way, should wear the same clothes, should build the same houses, should and so on. That's totalitarianism. It's just a radical incapacity to experience the fundamental uncertainty of human existence as, a, as the precondition for creation, singularity and uniqueness in life. So as people are swept up into this uh, certainty, right, and many people willingly run towards that because they didn't like whatever was going on before, and you've mentioned the condition, the atomization of self and, and people feeling alone and isolated and, and free-floating anxiety, these things, those are sort of the building blocks that allow somebody who says, hey, I, I know how to do this, and people get swept up in it. I want to uh, probe a word with you to make sure we have common meaning around this, and this is around the inevitability of it all. So there's always, to me, you, you, you went around that concept quite a bit. It's inevitable, right? So it was so inevitable that, that Jews would show up at the cattle cars at the appointed time because it was inevitable. I guess I got to get on there. The people would show up for the train to go to the gulags. There's this inevitability. So when I hear um, this inevitability of, this, of the transhumanists, right? The, the WF, the Davos crowd, the Yuvals. Um, th th there's just this inevitability. Like, it's just inevitable. We're, we're going to get rid of cows and we're going to eat crickets. Uh, you're going to lose all your privacy. You're going to end up with a chip under your skin that's going to detect your state of being. Like, it's just inevitable. This is where we're going. And I think a lot of people are swept up in that inevitability that this is just the way things go. But that's a feature always, I think, of totalitarianism. And it's, it's, never, it's never as total as they make it they, they want to make it seem, right? It's, it's actually, there are exits off of that inevitability. 
But I feel that inevitability right now that there are a lot of people really pushing, and it's not in my country alone. It's across a big swath of humanity, and that, too, is a different feature for me right now because a lot of your examples are country-specific, culture-specific. Now it's a little broader than that, I guess. Um, what's your reaction to that inevitability and in the, in the breadth of what we're facing? Yes, the, the inevitability, the, the, the feeling of inevitability uh, is a consequence of the psychological process uh, that is going on, of course. That's exactly what this mechanism of mass formation explains. It explains why it seems to, it, the most absurd theories seem inevitably right when, when you are in a mass formation. That's, that's, the, that's the entire, that's exactly what uh, the, the mechanism of mass formation shows so clearly, that, that when you are in it, when you are in the mass formation, your attention is so focused, you see only a very small part of reality and you see only these things that confirm the narrative you believe in and all the rest you are not aware of any, uh, 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 any longer. So that's, that's, what, that's a strange fact in, indeed. And that, that, that's the explanation why uh, people in the end start to be, um, become convinced that if the number of contaminations with the corona crisis increase a little bit, that the country should go into lockdown, that there is no other option. And you, there is no, you cannot make clear at that moment. That's what Hannah Arendt said. Hannah Arendt said the, 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 the tragedy of totalitarianism is that as soon as you ex accept uh, the starting point, A, then you also, then you have to go to the end of the, of the murderous alphabet, she said. As soon as you say A, you have to say B, C, D until Z, until the end of the murderous alphabet. And it's strange for someone who is not in the grip of the phenomenon. He sees very clearly how absurd it is. He sees like, okay, you want to save some people's lives by going into lockdown, but these lockdowns will kill maybe 100 times more people uh, than the virus could, could kill. So, but, but no matter how many times you will repeat that to someone, no matter how much you uh, will try to show them, uh, the absurdity of the of the of their line of reasoning, they usually won't be convinced simply because they are in the state of mass formation, which which makes uh, the focus of attention so narrow, and which focuses all the psychological energy so much on a very limited set of representations that the other representations have no impact anymore. For for someone who is in the grip of the corona narrative or who was in the grip of the corona narrative, the only image of victims that was to which psychological energy was attached was the corona victim uh, mm -hmm. the people who committed suicide the children who starved uh, 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 who died of hunger as a consequence of the lockdowns in developing countries these images um, there was no psychological energy anymore attached attached to these animals and no, to these images and no matter how much you did your best to to evoke them and to show them to the people they had no impact anymore so that in the end, it's, it's something like that. This process that leads to this experience of uh, inescapability. And the only way to save ourselves, the only way to deal with the problems we have is this uh, uh, totalitarian ideology. Uh, yes, well, I, I, I think, uh, well, we, we, we discussed this mechanism of the process of mass formation in our previous conversation. Uh, but 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 that I think that is what explains that exact that's exactly uh, why this theory of mass formation is important I think because it makes you can make you understand that it shows uh, why people are in this strange mental state in which they become completely blind for everything that shows that what they believe in uh, is absurd it can go so far like in Iran during the revolution in Iran. Uh, in 1978 and 1979, which was the beginning of a very large-scale process of mass formation in Iran, people started to believe that the uh, photograph, the picture of their leader, the Ayatollah, was printed on the surface of the moon. And when there was a full moon in the sky, people were standing in the streets, pointing at the moon, showing each other where exactly you could see the picture of the Ayatollah. So it's, it's, it's crazy how far mass formation can go, and it's crazy... Uh, how absurd the ideas can be in which the masses start to believe um, and also how absurd the cruelty can become which follows from this uh, complete blindness uh, so I've been talking with someone with a woman of Iran Shoref Eshtani 
who lived in Iran during, during the revolution in Iran, and she said that she had seen with her own eyes how a mother reported her son to the state and how she put the rope around his neck on the scaffold. And when he was hung, when he died, she claimed to be a heroine for what she did. That's the end stage of mass formation, this radical intolerance for everything that goes against this absurd theory uh, the masses believe in, uh, and which uh, the cruelties which are committed to everyone, even to the people whom uh, they used to love most before the uh, mass formation started, such as their own children, their own sons and daughters. And that is all of this interview that I'm comfortable having out here in public. You want to see the rest. It's amazing. Come to peakprosperity.com. Check it out because we're going to talk about and continue this conversation and go into some other topics. See you there.